Good morning, everyone. May God bless you and keep you on this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning in August. Uh, I want to thank God for allowing him to wake us up and see another day today to give us clarity, to give us focus on who he is, right? That there is a dividing line in this life that we live today between righteousness and unrighteousness. It's up to us to, to decide what is right, what is wrong, what is darkness, what is light, right? What is right and what is wrong, right? These are the things that we must decide in this world today. And that's what we're going to get into today, right? When we, when God has given us more than enough, more than enough, where our cup has just ran over tremendously, right? Throughout our lives, where it's been inherited and given to us, right? Uh, that it's uh, family wealth, for, uh, for example, and it's been given to us that, you know, how do we behave with that wealth? Do we, do we trust in God or do we trust in man, right? Scripture says that, uh, that we shouldn't trust in, 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 in money, but and, and, and men, right, and material things, but we should always put our trust in God, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today, very briefly. We're going to talk about the needle threader, right? In Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 27, it speaks of a particular event where in the book of Mark, we see another emotion of Jesus Christ, that he is emotionally hurt, that he is emotionally taken aside by the response from this individual, but let's go to God in prayer before we get into this, the needle threader. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing your grace and your mercy to, to, to shine upon us once again today. Thank you for your love and your compassion, Lord Jesus, and your continued uh, presence with the Holy Ghost being within us. Thank you for our bodies and uh, you know being a temple of the Holy Ghost and help us to keep these temples clean, right? Continue to watch over us and bless us and keep us on this day. Watch our communities, watch our, uh, our, our, our nation, our, our political leaders. Watch and bless each and every one of them that they may have clarity and focus and how to do their work. Bless and keep them, all those who are in Russia and Ukraine and North Korea and Taiwan and all parts of the world. Bless all of those who may be going through some form of turmoil because we know that there are wars and there are also rumors of war. And we know that these are the last days that we're moving into. And so, Lord, bless and keep them on this special day. Lord, I'm just going to ask this prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Mark 10, 17 through 27, and we're going to read it in its entirety, right? The needle threader, right? Oftentimes in life, we need help. We need the assistance of others. And what happens is oftentimes when you see people, my mother used to sew and I've known other people in my family that used to sew and things like this. And you'd watch them with their, with their eye, with their glasses down like this. And they're trying to thread the needle or they would say, give it to a young person and say, thread this needle for me, right? Because they needed some form of assistance. They needed someone to help thread that needle because it was so small that they couldn't get the, the thread through the needle. And this is how Christ sees us today, right? We need his assistance. We need his help in order to navigate through the eye of that needle. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the needle threader, that Jesus Christ is that needle threader, and he is the one that will make it easy for us to navigate through the needle, whether we are rich, poor, black, white, it doesn't matter, that he will allow us or give us an opportunity, because later in the scripture, it states that all things are possible through God. So let's read this in its entirety, for the night is far spent and the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and we will put on the armor of light. Mark 10, 17 through 27, the needle threader. And when he was gone forth into the way, there come to one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit life? And Jesus says unto him, why calleth thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. That thou knowest the, you know, thou knowest the commandments, right? Jesus is asking him, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy, defraud not and honor thy father and thy mother. And, he, and a ruler, a rich young ruler answered, he said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him, meaning he loved him, right? Had compassion on him and said unto him, one thing that thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Go thy way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great 
possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God, seeking a response from his disciples? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking up upon them, said, With men it is impossible, with God all things are possible. In our society today, right, in our, in our, you know, the way we are living today and how we see our, our, the wealthy individuals of the world today, right, many of the richest, wealthiest men uh, throughout the globe, uh, many reside here in the United States. Uh, the richest man in the United States currently, as of August 2023, is Elon Musk at $240 billion. And then there's Bernard Arnault of France, who has $231 billion. Jeff Bezos comes in third with $154 billion. Larry Ellison, $146 billion. Bill Gates, $119 billion. Warren Buffett, $117 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, $115 billion. And the list goes on and on and on. The beautiful thing about this is that God has given them this wealth. They will also live the type of life that we live today. And what is appointed to man, the scripture says, right, is death and then, <laughs> right, and then the judgment. So these men will, uh, will go through the same process as us, but God has given, given them or enabled them with great wealth. And they will be judged on what they have done in this life for the very poor or those who are the needy because he has given them an abundance, right? Their cup runs over, over and over and over, right? That they have so much wealth that they won't be able to spend it. Their family or their family after them, their family, their immediate family, no one will be able to spend all the money that they, that they have. So, I mean, of course, all of us being judges, right? We can sit here and say, oh, well, Bill Gates, right? Which would be, used to be the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, before the divorce. But he's always doing great things. He is inventing things. He's all over Africa. He's all over Asia doing all types of things, right? You know, ensuring that there's clean drinking water, digging wells, uh, giving, uh, you know, establishing showers and, and you know, in, in the deserts and things like this. Coming up with all types of inventions to help those, the needy, right? He addresses maternal and child health issues and things like this all over the world to ensure that men, women, and children have the best health care in the world, Right? or you know, in, their, in their vicinity or, or the nation that they live in, right? Bringing it out to them in rural parts, the most ruralist parts of the world that, we, that many of us will never see. But all of us have done great things, right? And so that's why God prefaces this thing that we should not judge these individuals, but God will judge them, right? Because he goes on and says that, you know, with, with men, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So we don't know the heart's, of these men. We don't know uh, their destiny. We don't know what great things that they have done for God, right? Was it the invention of a car, you know, by Elon Musk? You know, maybe, it's, maybe that has saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people that they're, who couldn't afford fuel. I mean, we, we don't know the stories, right? Warren Buffett with his, with his books and I, ideologies on how to make wealth and save money and start businesses and things like this, we, we just don't know. So with God, all things are possible. But what we're going to be talking about, right, is the fact that, they're, that, that, that man must come to grips to the fact that they have more than enough. And that there should be a, a, you know, a, a beating at their heart or pulling at their heart telling them that I have so much that I should be giving to the poor or I should be developing foundations to help the poor and the needy, building hospitals and clinics and things like this. But I don't want to beat that up, right? What we find in this passage of Scripture are three important points, right? that we must do in order to follow God, in order to be in his abundant grace and mercy, and that he will continue to show compassion upon us. We should dispose of all things that distract of us. And that's what he asked them, this rich man, this rich young ruler. And what you must realize, like when you read this, when you read it really, really slow, he did not tell this rich young ruler to get rid of his business, to get rid of his house. He just said, I want you to sell all that you have and give to the poor, and then you will find treasure in heaven. I, I, I don't want you to give up your businesses. I, I, I just want to see, you know, how ambitious you are towards me. How much do you love me, 
right? And we're going to get into this uh, as, as it relates to the Ten Commandments, right? How obedient are you to my will is what he's asking him. I, I don't want you to give up everything. He didn't ask uh, Zacchaeus to give up everything. Zacchaeus found uh, within his heart, there was a pulling at his heart that he went out and, and gave back to all those people that he had defrauded, right? And that's what God is asking this rich young ruler today, okay? So I want you to dispose of all things that distract us. And this is, this is pointed towards us, not just him, right? Dispose of all those things that distract us from the presence, right? These inanimate objects that we should, that we also, that we all put in front of God. That number two, we should, we must go our way, meaning we must seek out those who are in need of coats and shoes, right? Blankets, medicine, the basics of life, right? And give to them. If we have more than enough, if God has given us more than enough, he is, he is waiting for us, anxiously awaiting for us to give to others who have nothing. It's what he is telling this rich young ruler. And then the third thing he says, Jesus, the Son of God, promises that if we do these things in his name, we shall have eternal life. If we do these things in Christ's name, not in our name, not in the name of Elon Musk, not in the name of Jeff Bezos, right, or Warren Buffett, if we do these things in the name of Jesus Christ, we will find treasure in heaven. But in the meantime, we should also, also take on the sufferings of the world as a gift of God, right? That, that through suffering, we come closer to God, right? In all suffering, God's grace is sufficient, right? So those are the three points that we wanted to make, right? And that we will be following in this text today. To, to text today. To be a follower of Christ, one must first consider not the individual self, but the wealth and the well-being of others. Jesus did come to save those that are well, but to sick, right? In other words, to be a follower of Christ, there, 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 there will have to be some sacrifices that take place in your life. Those sacrifices include the understanding that, that through turmoil, persecutions, through sickness and the conflicts of this world, right? Through the acts of forgiveness and praying for others, one must take on the ways of Christ by first loving God and then sharing in the gospel message of truth, mercy, and his abundant grace. Hmm. So what the unbeliever must understand is that even though good works, the good works of that of an individual based on individual pride will not upgrade you into the eyes of God. There's no policy statements. There's no, there's no pecking order that's going to get you into heaven. He is a heart healer. He's a heart seeker. He is looking at the, the ambitions of your heart. How readily are you able to give to others, right? He tells this rich young I don't want you to get rid of your businesses. I don't want you to take off all your clothes and uh, run around just in your undergarments. I don't want you to give up your shoes or anything. I just want you to sell all that you have. Right? Because what that will do, it will transform your life. You'll begin to see life in a much clearer way. You will not be living within uh, the scope of all the material and inanimate objects that, that, that surround you, all the servants and all the houses and the businesses that you have. Right? Once you first do that, there will be a heart pull, right? A pulling at your heart, a tugging at your heart that you will want to do that you will want to do right. And that's what God was testing him. This, I don't want to take away everything that I've already given to you because all things belong to me. Right? I just want to see how you fit into my kingdom right? by the use of your heart. The reason being is that God is not glorified in man's good works because they are done out of self-indulgence. He's not impressed with those things. What are you doing for me? Jesus tells us that the first commandment that, that one should what? love God first. And secondly, place no other gods before him, whether in stone and metal and wood, right? Or cloth or whatever. Nor should we place any glory in the angels of love above. Our focus is on God and God alone. And this is why Jesus is asking him this question, right? In a few moments, we're going to get into this. That he asked him this question, right? The, 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 these commandments, see. You've obeyed these commandments, right? He's almost like a setup. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He knows the heart of this young man. Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, right? Do not do, not do these things, right? All these things are individual acts. And of course, a young man says, yeah, I haven't done any of those things. But what Christ is asking him, what have you done for God? Did you look at the, the, first, the first six commandments, right? That begin to tell us what man must do, right? In order to... To, to be a follower of Christ, to, to, in order to be in love with God, right? To put God first, that you don't have any other 
things or inanimate objects or material goods or anything above God. I don't care what they are, right? Clothes, cars, boats, women, right? Nations, right? Don't put any of those things before God. Have no other gods before me, right? How much do you love me? How, 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 how willing are you to give up these things for me? Right? Jesus tells us that the first commandment, that, that one should love God first, and secondly, place no other gods before him, whether in, in, in these inanimate objects. So our focus is on God and God alone and what he's asking him. He's pretty much asking this rich young ruler, right, to finish those Ten Commandments. So you've done all these things, right, these individual things, right? Those were easy for you. But now you're asking for an easy way into salvation, you're asking for, you're asking me, is there a cheat sheet in getting to salvation because you're this rich man? That you already know within your heart that you should be giving to the poor. You already know within your heart that you have more than enough. You already know within your heart, right, what I am about to tell you. That you need to give more to the poor. That you have more than enough. That you, you, you're walking around thinking they, that these things are going to last forever. They are not going to last forever. You, that you are on borrowed time. All your goods are going to be given to someone else one day. Are you obedient to me? Right? God's heart is sad. He's disappointed in this man. There's a parable that Jesus spoke about in the book of Matthew 21, 28, and 31. And it goes like this. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not go. But afterward he repented and he went. And he came to the second son and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he went not. Whether them did the, uh, did the will of his father. right? And they say unto him, The first did the will of the father. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He's looking for people who are willing and able to do the will of God. If this rich young ruler was to give 10% of all that he had, because we know that Abraham did with, with, uh, with uh, 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 Melchizedek, right? We know he did this, right? Which started the practice pretty much was the starting practice of why we give 10% to God in the first place, right? It goes way back then in the Old Testament. So why wouldn't he give? Abraham was a very wealthy man, right? So he's only asking for a portion of this man's, uh, uh, t uh, t his, his talents, right? Or the things that he owns. I don't want to take everything that I have that I've already given to you. But what about your heart? Here's two other examples, right? When you think about the story of Job, right? These things were taken away from Job because God allowed Satan to come and remove these things from him to test his heart, to test Job's heart, to take his children, to take his wealth, to take everything he owned, right? And what happened in the end, as we fast forward, Job receives double of what God had given him in the first place because he did not curse God. He did not give up on God, even though his wife said, curse God and die, and his friend said, you must have done something wrong, Job, in order for God to be so angry with you, right? What have you done? He did not curse God and die, right? God did chastise him for several, for several chapters, right? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world and watered lilies no man's ever seen and talks about the, the lions, do you feed the lions when they are hungry and things like this, right? Breaks it down. Job said, listen, I, 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 I can't say anymore. I, I, can't, I, I put my hand over my mouth. I can't speak no more, Lord. You, you are God. And this is why Jesus is so distraught. He is so upset with this young man out of love and compassion for him because he knows that he has placed great wealth above the love of God. In other words, God is looking for a heart of obedience. When we go back, my second example was this, right? This may be a stretch, but when you think about uh, the children of Israel, right? When they came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Think about this when you get a chance. So when you relate that story to them, right? That, that I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you freedom. I've given you the wealth of all of Egypt. You spoiled the Egyptians. You took all of their wealth. And now I'm giving you freedom. You're out here in the wilderness. And yet, you still don't recognize me or still don't accept me as your God, Yahweh. That you continue to do what you want to do. That you're out here complaining, I've given you a great prophet by the name of Moses. 
And you're out here complaining, wishing that you were back in bondage again, eating of the leeks and, and, and the fruits of Egypt, working seven days a week. You'd rather have that than what I've given you? In the context of this story today, that's what we find in the story today. Listen, I have given you everything, young rich young ruler. I've given your father and your, your forefathers, however, however you got this wealth, you didn't have to do anything to earn this wealth. It has been given to you. And yet you cannot give up any of it. You can't sell all that you have readily right now, right? I'm not telling you to give up all your wealth. I'm testing your heart. I want to see, can you be obedient towards me in those first few commandments? That you love God first, that you put no other gods before him, right? Can you do that for me? Then you'll show that you love me. Hmm. In other words, God is looking for a heart of obedience. Over in 1 Samuel 15 and 22, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the vice of the Lord, force of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. So in this passage of scripture, Samuel is having a conversation with Saul concerning the destruction of King Agag. Got to read this. Of uh, King of, of um, Amalek. For rebellion is as a sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul was supposed to do one thing, destroy all the Amalekites, King Amalek, all the rams, goats, sheep, women, children, everything. And he didn't do it. Samuel says, what is this bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ear? You were supposed to destroy everything. That's all you were supposed to do, right? But Saul, right, thinking about the physical, thinking about himself, thinking about, oh, well, these are great sheep. These are great oxen, you know, oxen and ram. We can use those as a sacrifice for God. God, God doesn't need your sacrifice. He wants your obedience. And that's what we find in this text today. And so God left King Saul at that moment. He said, I can't, I can't. I found one younger, you know. I'm going to anoint him to be the next king of Israel because of your disobedience. Hmm. You have rejected the word of the Lord. He also rejected you from being king. And what we find in this text today, God is not readily ready to reject this young, rich young ruler. I'm hoping, you know, Christ kept an eye on him, and I'm sure he did, that maybe there was a change of heart later on that day or maybe that week or that year. That he began to see after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that, you know what? I, I should have paid attention to him. Let me start today. Let me start giving away what I have today, right? To the poor and to the needy, right? So and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him, right? As we break this down and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may have, have in, 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 internal life? As we find it again in the book of Mark, we find one running, right? We, one showing obeisance to the Son of Man. One came running is intriguing is in that Mark is telling us that wealth and age and gender, rich or poor, all come running to Jesus all throughout the book of Mark. Meaning there is no specific pecking order of importance when it comes to those seeking Christ. But we all must one day come to repentance to God and begin to ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And at that last moment, it is up to us to listen to what God is trying to tell us. For he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is trying to tell him. All right? And Jesus said unto him, that verse 18, Why calleth thou me good? There's none good but one that is God. And I know this tricks tri people up, right? In the scripture, we find Jesus correcting the young man. Yes, Jesus Christ is good. He is the Holy Trinity of God, right? All three are one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But this young man is seeing Jesus, the man, as, as, as a good master, but not as the son of God. I'm not recognizing you as the Christ or as the Messiah, but as a good teacher, right? But not Jesus, the man, being the son of God, right? When we look solely at Jesus, the man, we lose sight into who he really is. If we just see him as a man or just see him as a healer or as a teacher, right? Right? God is incarnate, but, 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 but more than that, God, right, is now incarnate right now in the flesh at that moment. But what God is trying to tell him is that, listen, there is one mightier that lives within me, within me, within me, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? 
So why call me good, right? Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not and honor thy father and thy mother. So we find in this verse that the rich young ruler focuses on those commandments that focus on the individual. He's asking, Jesus is pretty much asking him, can you finish the rest? <laughs> you know about these others, but can you finish the rest, right? That you should put God first. If you put God first, then we wouldn't be having this conversation now. And being a rich man, you would have already given to the poor, right? So these are sins of the flesh and not of that of the Spirit. The remaining commandments focus on the spiritual context of one's relationship to God and how to adjoin to God in the Spirit, how we should connect to God in the Spirit, how we should connect to God in the Spirit, how we should connect to God in the Spirit is what we're talking about in those Ten Commandments. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And that verse 21, then Jesus beholding him, meaning he loved him, had compassion on him, right? Wants him to get it right? Wants him to understand that there's treasure waiting for him in heaven that's much, much bigger, much, much better than the treasures you have on earth. One thing that thou lack is go thy way, right? I want you to go your way, meaning depart from me immediately, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. As I stated, don't give up your business, don't give up your servants, all the workers that are under you, your vineyards, all that. But at this moment, can you go and sell all that you have? Because more than likely, if you sell all that you have, you're going to get double in return, even, on, even in this world. So in this passage of Scripture, we find is, is, is Jesus' love for the young man. He understands his commitment in doing what he thinks is good and what should secure eternal life. But Jesus loves him, right? He loves him, Right? expresses something more spiritual, which is to sell all that you have, meaning dispose of all your worldly possessions that are hindering you from seeking Christ. Second, I want you to give to the poor, meaning I want you to have the experience, right? The heart of me, that to give is better than receiving, right? To give is better than receiving. That men will find joy in a loving, giving heart, which is the first act of humanity in one's own spirituality, that if you continue to give, right, it's better than receiving, and that God will recognize your giving heart. That verse 22, and he, went, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So what does it profit a man if he was to gain the whole world and lose his soul? A few moments ago, we went down the list of all these, these very, very rich men, right, who fly to the moon, right, for five minutes, you know, take people up hundreds of thousands of dollars, and, you know, they have this great wealth, and Pretty much, oftentimes, they don't know what to do with it, <laughs> right? But we cannot judge them because we do hope that they are changing the hearts and minds of others. Hmm. So what does a prophet of man if he was to gain the whole world and lose his soul, right? Scripture tells us, I believe in the book of Revelation, that, you know, what, what, you know, what, what value is, you know, what, what value can, can a man put on his own soul, right? So we learn that Jesus, right, uh, knocked on the door of this young man's heart, but he refused to open. Hmm. Jesus offered to carry his burdens, but he chose not to seek the assistance of a loving God, a loving Savior, willing to save him. And at verse 23, And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they have riches enter into the kingdom of God? So in this verse, we can never discount the thoughts of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, that you through his poverty might be rich. You know, it's all about being rich. He's the owner of all things, cattle of a thousand hills, right? Everything on this planet, inside and out, and the universe belongs to him. So he could care less about the riches. He already has all the riches. He created all the riches. And the riches that you have, the money that you have in your pocket, the house you live in today, the car you drive, the job you have, the jewelry you wear, all these things belong to him. Hmm. That's why we always have to give God praise, as my dad always says. We can never discount the fact that Jesus didn't understand what it was to be poor because it is Jesus who understands the dynamics of being rich and being poor. He put down his royal diadem, right? His, his leadership over a multitude of angels, right? And his seat next to a loving God. 
and came and gave his life that we may have life eternal with him one day. Hmm. It is Jesus who holds the wealth of the entire universe, right? And all he's doing is this. He's seeking and he's knocking to get closer to our hearts, to dwell in our hearts forevermore. And the disciples were astonished in that verse 24 at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to him, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, theologians surmise that there was a particular gate um, uh, throughout Jerusalem where you know, camels or, or animals and things like this tried to go through, but it was very difficult for them to go through because of the hump in their back. Right? So they could not go through that particular gate. So what we find in this text today is that Christ is the needle threader. He is the one that will make it easy for us to see through the eye of the needle, to be able to ascertain and understand that it, even with great wealth, he is able to make a way out of no way in order for us to inherit eternal life. Hmm. Who can be saved, the disciples asked. And Jesus says, looking up unto them, says, with men it is impossible, with God all things are possible. I am the needle threader. I am the needle threader. I am the one that can make the impossible possible. I am the one who can see through the eye of the needle. I created the eye of the needle. I created wealth. I created the poor. I, I created the rich. So even though this man is walking away sorrowfully, in time, maybe, maybe we will see him in heaven. That maybe that day, as I stated, or weeks or months later, or years later, that he changed his heart and he began to, to sell and to give, right? And become and, and make a difference in the lives of many in that community. So our scripture today speaks of a time when Jesus gives clear instructions on what we all must do to follow him and to be accepted into the kingdom of God. We must first dispose of all things that distract us from the presence of God. Because God comes first which is the very first of the Ten Commandments. We must go our way, meaning we must seek out those who are in need of things like coats and shoes and blankets and the basic necessities of life, health care. If we have more than enough, if God has given us more than enough, he is waiting for us to give to others who have absolutely nothing because he is testing our own hearts. He wants to see, can we be more like him? to have a giving, loving heart. And then lastly, Jesus, the Son of God, promises that if we do these things in his name, not in the names of men, but in his name, we shall have eternal life. And not only that, treasure in heaven. So all these things you think you have in this world today, it's like, wow, I got all this stuff. Can you imagine, multiply that, multiply that by maybe a billion, right? We will have unfathomable wealth in heaven. We will be kingdom leaders. We will be over kingdoms and things like this, right? We'll be teaching and uh, teaching the angels, having conversations with the angels. They're going to be asking us, how did you make it over? How with just, just a little bit of faith that you made it through that particular instance in your life? Hmm. In conclusion, God wants us to know that he, right, that he has not forgotten us, right? In Exodus 19 and 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. This is what you shall speak to the children of Israel, the children of God. Hmm. The needle threader. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, thank you for allowing your presence to be heard today and felt. I pray, Heavenly Father, that someone will get something out of this message today, that even though it seems impossible, that maybe they feel like they have sinned too much and that God is not paying attention to them, that God does not love them. No, no, they are the apple of God's eye. He loves everyone. He created all of us for his own unique purpose. So, Lord, make a way out of no way for those who feel that the eye of the needle is just a stretch. I can, I, 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 there's no way I can make it in because my burdens are too heavy. God, loose the burdens. Take the burdens upon or away from these individuals, right? And make it easy for them to enter into the eye of the needle because you are the needle threader. Bless us and keep us on this day. Make our paths straight, and we will be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and the praise. 
and it is in the matchless name of Jesus, the Christ we pray. Amen.